Good morning, North Sound Church. It's wonderful being with you again this morning. Welcome to Sunday Morning Live. We come this morning to light the candle of love. Christ brought love for you and for me. Would you join us this morning by singing, Oh, come, all ye faithful. Well, good morning. As we celebrate the fourth week in Advent, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. We want to remind you that we pray for you each week. And if you have prayer requests that you'd like us to know about, please let us know through info at northsoundchurch.com. Or if you've moved or there's other things that you want us to know, you can also contact us through that way. We have several things that are going on around Advent. 
First of all, if you check out our website, you'll see a number of resources, including our Advent devotional. It follows along with the different themes that we're covering in Advent, and so we encourage you to download that as a way to continue your celebration of this Advent season. We want to acknowledge that for some of us, the, the time around Christmas is not necessarily celebratory or joyful. Perhaps you've lost someone this year. Perhaps you're just struggling because you've had a, a rough year. There's, this has been a hard year for so many of us. If you're struggling with discouragement and having a hard time keeping up with those who are celebrating, I want to encourage you to attend our Longest Night Gathering online. I will be hosting this on December 21st at 7 p.m. And it will just be a time to spend acknowledging our grief together. You'll be able to find the link for this on our website, and it will also be in the newsletter this week. We also want you to know that our Christmas Eve services will be available on the website on December 24th in the morning, so you can figure out how it will best work for you during the day as you celebrate with your family. And then looking ahead to the new year, there will be a three-week prayer class that will start on um, January 11th on Mondays. This is just for three weeks, and it's just to kind of help us learn and understand and engage with God in more ways of, of conversing with Him back and forth. I know we're good, I think, at asking for um, what we need but this will give us an opportunity to begin to listen more to what God might be saying to us. And so I encourage you to register for that on info at northsound.com. And if you have any questions, you can contact me about that. It's good to have you worshiping with us this morning. And now we welcome the Davis family to come and light our candle. The first three candles of the Advent wreath have been relit, the candles of hope, peace, and joy. Today, we light the fourth candle of Advent. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most precious gift. As God is love, let us be love also. From the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to come on, condemn it, but to save it. Let us pray. Teach us to love, O oh Lord. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives. As we prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth, also fill our hearts with love for the world, that all may know your love and the one whom you have sent, your Son, our Savior. Amen. <laughs>
has a star in the east on Christmas morn. Rise up, shepherd, and follow. It will lead to the place where the Savior's born. Rise up, shepherd, and follow. Leave your sheep and leave your lambs. Rise up, shepherd, and follow. Leave your ewes and leave your rams. Rise up, shepherd, and follow. Shepherd and follow. If you take good heed to the angel's word, rise up, shepherd, and follow. You'll forget your cloaks, you'll forget your hurts. Rise up, shepherd, and follow. Need your flocks and need your lambs. Rise up. Shepherd and follow.
Let us join our hearts together in prayer this morning. Gracious God, as we near the day when we celebrate your birth, we are reminded that you already dwell in our hearts as believers, all day, every day. We worship you and adore you, and we ask that you would continue to work in our lives so that we might be a reflection of your light in the world around us. Gracious Lord, we confess that we have not always lived for you in our hearts, in our attitudes, and in our actions this week. There have been times when our lives have missed the mark, and we humbly thank you that your forgiveness and mercy is there. We have only to confess. And so we lift our hearts up to you, asking for your grace and mercy to flood into every nook and cranny with your forgiveness and your cleansing. Gracious God, as we enter into this fourth week of Advent, we want to lift up those we know and love who are suffering and feel far from celebrating. Gracious God, we pray for those who are sick and ask that you would heal them quickly and fully and be near them. Bless those who are caring for them and protect them. We pray for those who are faced with an unwanted or unexpected medical diagnosis, and we ask that you will be near them and surround them with your peace and wisdom. For those recovering from surgery, Lord God, continue to restore them to complete healing. And Lord, we pray for those who are struggling during this season due to loss, depression, anxiety, and ask that you would give them peace that you would be very near to comfort them. Gracious God, may we all find in this season hope that breaks through despair, peace that overcomes fear and discord, joy that coexists with our pain and brings us comfort, and love that covers all things in you. As we close our prayer, we lift our lives up to you, praying with our sisters and brothers across the world and the generations, the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, it's great to be with you this fourth Sunday of Advent. We saw the candle of love being lit today, and uh, we are excited in just a few days to light the Christ candle in the middle of our Advent wreath. I want to remind you that tomorrow night, the 21st, we have a gathering that we call the Longest Night Gathering. And it's an opportunity that's led by Pastor Nancy. And you have an opportunity just to join her and to process uh, some of the losses that you may have experienced this year. Perhaps loss of a family member, um, loss of a job, um, loss of a relationship. And uh, we just want to provide a place at Christmas time uh, to just spend some time with others processing that loss but you don't need to say anything or do anything. You're just welcome to join. The link uh, for that, it will be a Zoom gathering, will be on the website and we encourage you to, uh, to gather and join us. I have some really good news to share and that is that Earl and Ellen Janes are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, Earl and Ellen. Earl and Ellen are special people. They were with us from the very beginning when we were just beginning North Sound Church and have served faithfully in worship ministry and Sunday school ever since. Thanks, Earl and Ellen, and happy anniversary. Well, sometimes my kids surprise me by liking the music from my generation, and it surprises me because I guess I don't expect that, but sometimes I'll play a song and they seem to be familiar with that particular song. And I want to talk to you about a story that I came across recently about a song that apparently not only my generation, but also the next generation may recognize. It's a song that uh, began very early in the morning. Pastor Alan and I compare notes about waking up at 3 a.m. and processing issues at that time and having trouble getting back to sleep. Well, this is a song that began uh, at 3 a.m. And the artist, the composer, uh, is named Mick Jones and the band is Foreigner. That may give you a clue as to where I am going with this. And he says this, he says, I always worked late when everybody left and the phone stopped ringing. But he says, this song came up at 3 a.m. And he said, I consider it, it that it was a gift sent through me. I think there was something bigger than me behind it. I'd say it was probably written entirely by a higher force. Now his band began to work on this song that came early in the morning, but Mick said there was something that was missing and he realized what he wanted to do was enhance it in a spiritual way. He said, in the end, I was having lunch with a guy who ran a gospel music label. He sent me a bunch of albums. One of them I was by the New Jersey Mass Choir. And he said, when I heard them, I immediately finished the song in my head. He said, when I watched them in rehearsal, I drove out to New Jersey and it was fantastic. He said, they were fresh. They'd never recorded for a mainstream album before. But one of the descriptions of the development of this song says there was another moment of what seemed to be divine intervention, divine inspiration. We, uh, we, we hear from Mick saying this, he says, we got about 30 of the choir, the New Jersey Mass Choir, into the Right Track studio in New York. He said, we did a few takes and it was good, but it was still a bit tentative. So then they all got round in a circle, held hands and said the Lord's Prayer. And it seemed to inspire them because after they did that, we did the song in one take. I was in tears because my mom and dad were in the studio and it was so emotional. But there was one last thing he wanted to do and that was he wanted to invite Ahmet Atigan, the president of Atlantic Records, into the studio. And so one night he brought him in. This is the guy that, that uh, boy, if you wanted to have your song get passed, uh, he was the guy to listen to it. He's the guy that discovered uh, Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. And so now he got him in the studio and he played him this song. And he said, when he got to the second chorus, he looked over at the president of Atlantic Records and there were tears coming down his cheeks. 
So he said, we, we sat there and listened. And as he said, I looked over in his direction and saw those tears. He said, and the song was appropriately released at Christmas time in 1984, and it rose to number one around the world. I want you to take just a moment. We're just going to play just a little bit of this song. I want to know what love is. That's in the heart of every human being. God has placed that desire in the heart of every human being. And that's why the song was so successful. And friends, that's why we at Christmas time celebrate God's love. The yearning of the human heart is found in that baby in Bethlehem. Perhaps the most profound summary of the Christmas story isn't in the story that we have in Matthew or the story that is often read from the Gospel of Luke, but perhaps the most profound summary is from the Gospel of John, where we read those words that many of us memorized as probably first graders. Those wonderful words in John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Mary, Joseph, the angels, the wise men, all of those that, that gathered at one time or another around this child, and especially the baby Jesus, happened as a result of God's love extended towards us, for God so loved the world. And the, the Bible is just full of wonderful promises of God's love for us. Let's just take a moment and, and realize some of the wonder of God's love revealed in Scripture. My child, do you know how much I love you? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Every day of your life, I record it in my book. I laid out every moment before a single day had passed. For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. I can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. Delight yourself in me, and I'll give you the desires of your heart. Cast your cares on me, and I will sustain you. For I am close to the brokenhearted. I am always with you, and will wipe away every tear from your eyes. If you ever feel unloved, remember, I love you so much that I sent my one and only Son, Jesus, to die as a sacrifice for your sins. Believe in Him and you'll never perish but have eternal life. That's how much I love you. So remember, my child, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate you from my love. Absolutely nothing. I love you your Heavenly Father. Have you ever felt the love of God the Father? Some of us may have come into the Christian faith through what we call intellectual assent. That is, we, we recognize the, the truth of the story. Jesus was a historical person, and he was a unique historical person, and either he was a lunatic because he claimed he was God, or he was a liar for that same reason, or in fact he was who he said he was. And the character that we see revealed on the pages of Scripture is not a lunatic, not a liar. We think he must be the Lord. And that story begins in Bethlehem, but, but it's more than a story because that baby that came into Bethlehem was the Son of God. 
And he sent his spirit to be with us as he went back to be with the Father. And that spirit is alive and we have an opportunity not just to choose by faith to believe this story, but we have an opportunity actually to love God. Have you ever fallen in love with God? I wanna suggest to us that our text this morning shows us so clearly that Christmas, the Christmas story begins with God's love for us. Remember last week we talked about the joy that God had in creation, in creating us. And we need to remember in, in this passage that we look at from John that God so loved the world that he gave, it began with God, it began with his love, and we didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to be good. We didn't have to do anything to earn that love, but in fact, he gave it to us. I want to invite you this morning to ponder that love. Sometimes at North Sound, we talk about the love between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God lives in community, a community of love. And in the context of that community of love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the true love that they have between them grows. Love just by nature tends to grow. It's creative. And God created us to share in that love. But we find in the scripture that the, the, the members of the Trinity tended to shine attention on the other members of the Trinity. It wasn't just about them, but in fact, they, they, they glorified, they, they shone the light on the other members of the Trinity. And, and then in the life of Jesus, we see how he modeled God's love. And we read these words uh, in John chapter 13. When he had washed their feet, that is Jesus, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me the teacher and the Lord and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, so also you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Love is expressed in humble service. Jesus expands on that. When we talks about how we actually love him, we, we love him in the context of the love that we show to others. In Matthew 25, Jesus helps us to understand how we love him, how we love Jesus. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Mother Teresa visited a hospice for AIDS victims in New York when she visited the United States. And she said this, she said, each AIDS victim is Jesus in a distressing disguise. Last week, I told the story of Brennan Manning and his wife, meeting a young lady who was a part of the Moonies in New Orleans. I wanna share another story from Brennan Manning this week. It's a story that goes back to a time when Brennan was a part of a, a group, uh, a monastic type group in Saint Remy, France. And he tells of the conversation that was being had around the table by these 
uh, monastic brothers, they had, they had taken a, a vow and, uh, and, and part of that vow was to work in very humble places and serve the Lord in that way. But this particular morning, as they gathered, they were complaining about their circumstances. The German brother remarked that our wages were substandard, says Brennan. Uh, they were 60 cents an hour, which does sound even back then um, substandard. He commented on how the employers were never seen in church on Sunday morning. The French brother suggested this showed hypocrisy. The Spanish brother said they were rude and greedy. The tone, he says, grew caustic and the salvos got heavier. And we concluded that these avaricious bosses were so self-centered that they probably were Cretans that slept all day Sunday and never once lifted their minds and hearts in thanksgiving to God. But he says Dominique sat at the end of the table and he said throughout our harangue, he never opened his mouth. And Brennan says he looked over at one point at him and tears were coming down his cheeks. What's the matter, Dominique, he asked. His voice was barely audible. What he said was, il ne comprenait pas. I don't understand. Brennan. How many times since that New Year's morning, that New Year's breakfast when they were complaining, has that single sentence turned his resentment in his own life into compassion? He said, how often have I reread the passion story of Jesus in the Gospels through the eyes of Dominique Villon, seen Jesus in the throes of his death agony, beaten, bullied, scourged, and spat upon, saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Once I was at a gathering of Christian leaders and this uh, person that was presenting said some words that I still remember and that is, he said that our particular tribe of, of people tend to be known for their mouths. We talk a lot about the gospel, but in fact, what we need to do is become arms and legs. Might God be calling us to readdress the needs of difficult people in our lives, the obnoxious, the needy, those who fall on the other side of the political spectrum without judgment and with compassion. Well, Brother Dominique's story doesn't end here. At the age of 54, he developed a serious cancer. And he moved at that time into a Paris, into a, 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 a very, um, part of Paris that was stricken with poverty. He got a job as a night watchman and when he got off work at eight o'clock in the morning, he would sit down with a group of older men on a park bench as they chatted together in the morning. These men were people on the margins of society. Brennan says they were drifters, winos, dirty old men who oogled the girls passing by. But Dominique didn't scold them he treated them, he accepted them as they were. He shared his meager possessions, his candy, and he, uh, he, he, after many years of doing this, they opened their hearts and they asked him about himself and he was able to talk to them about the love of God that transformed his life. And they saw his heart and they saw how he loved like Jesus. One day, um, they, having heard what he said, they found his witness to be a credible one and the, the dirty jokes and the comments and the oogling began to cease. One morning, Dominique did not show up at the usual time in the park and the gang in the park were concerned and a few hours later, they found him. He was dead on the floor of his cold water apartment in this Parisian suburb. Dominique Vuillaume never tried to impress anybody. He never wondered if his life was useful or meaningful. He never felt he had to do something great for God, but he kept a journal. And his last entry, Brennan says, was one of the most astonishing things I've ever read. This is what the last entry in Dominique Vuillaume's journal said. He said, all that is not the love of God has no meaning for me. But the love of God, which 
he said, I can truthfully say that I have no interest in anything but the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If God wants to, my life will be useful through my word and witness. If he wants it to, my life will bear fruit through my prayers and sacrifices. But the usefulness of my life is his concern, not mine, and it would be indecent of me to worry about that. Manning describes Dominique Guillaume as someone who lived entirely for God and for others. His community of brothers had an all night vigil for him and they buried him in a pine box in the backyard of the Little Brothers of Jesus community in St. Remy, France. They put a simple cross over his grave and the cross said, Dominique Vuillaume, a witness to Jesus Christ. And more than 7,000 people from across Europe gathered for his memorial service. Friends, this Christmas season, we need to remember that that babe in Bethlehem is an expression of God's love. And God's love is revealed in the life of that baby who became an adult and showed us how to live before going to the cross to become the means by which our sins are forgiven. He showed us how to live and he showed us to live means, to live in love means to serve others. May God help us in this Christmas season to remember those words from long ago that truly it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for the blessing of your presence, your promise that you live in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that wherever we may be gathered this fourth Sunday of Advent, as we talk about your love, I pray, Lord, that whatever it is that has drawn us to you, perhaps for some of us just a, an intellectual understanding of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus was a historical figure, that in fact he was the Son of God. I pray today, Lord, that you would help us to begin to fall in love with you. And having fallen in love with you, that our lives would carry that lives into a blessing of serving you and serving others. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Friends, I wanna invite you to join us coming up on this Christmas Eve day and then on Christmas Day, we will have a very special Christmas Eve service video that you can play anytime on Christmas Eve or anytime on Christmas Day that fits your family celebrations. But please don't miss it. We encourage you actually to share the availability of that video with others so that you can have a wonderful Christian Christmas experience this Christmas, beautiful music and sharing about the wonderful story of the babe in Bethlehem. Now let's be dismissed with God's blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore, amen.